Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, welcome. Um, and we do really um, appreciate the opportunity today to um, to present and, and we really are, a, um, Salsa really is a proud sponsor um, of Drupal South. Um, yeah, we want to we want to present today about building a, a simpler future with Drupal. Um, and in terms of the topics of today, um, we want to give some basic introductions, provide a little bit of background um, on Salsa for those that know Salsa, those that don't, um, highlight some, some recent projects, um, and also give a glimpse uh, into the future of some product offerings that, and, and where we're heading. And finally, we really encourage um, some open discussion and open dialogue um, at the end of the session. So we've left some time for that. So, so hopefully we go we go well there. Um, in terms of the intro, so three three um, speakers today. Um, myself, I'm Paul Morris, a director at Salsa Digital, and I head up um, projects and operations. Danielle, I'm Danielle Scheffler. I am a product manager and uh, also a business development lead. Uh, Akil. My name is Akil. I'm an engagement manager with Salsa. So a little bit about Salsa Digital. Um, we've been established for 15, 16 years now. Um, in the last eight years, we've had a very heavily heavy focus, pretty much an exclusive focus on, on government. Um, we're an open source company delivering technology and innovation, helping governments transform. Um, and this manifests on, and, and we'll see some examples of this as we move through the presentation, but just to highlight a couple now, um, GovCMS, the, our involvement in the GovCMS program for the Department of Finance at the federal level, and also Victoria's single digital presence for, Depart for Victoria's Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, we're also involved in a number of other whole of government um, initiatives that we'll sort of talk about as, as, as we move through the presentation. Um, to understand more about Salsa is to understand our real why. Um, and our why is centric to some common problems that we're seeing across government. Um, three common themes that we're observing, and I'm sure you know others in the audience have observed these too, but um, fragmentation. So we're seeing fragmentation across technology, across user experience, and many other forms of fragmentation are, are out there. Um, separate silos, so different folk trying to solve the same problems or civil, similar problems using disparate approaches. So siloing of, of information and approaches is, 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 is a big deal in what we're seeing as well and proprietary technologies. We're obviously speaking about Drupal here and open source, but where, where the proprietary solutions are, um, you know, resulting in vendor lock-in and, and prohibiting innovation, um, it's obviously, you know, we want to sort of mop that up and, and um, yeah, and, and, and address that. So, so with an understanding of the why and some common themes and patterns and problems that we see um, create Solstice's vision or our mission statement, if you like. And, and our mantra um, is to help make more open, more connected, and more consolidated government. But what, what does this really mean? Um, well, more open, um, we get involved in building more open platforms. Um, open APIs and, and open source technologies and their application in general. More connected, um, this one's multifaceted. There's a sort of a technology angle, governance angles, and other angles. Um, from the technology side, um, it's about building better technical solutions for engagement, connecting citizens more effectively. Um, and when we see some of the project examples, we'll see um, you know examples of that sort of connection and, um, and effective engagement. Uh, Governance-wise, um, is about sharing um, approaches and lessons um, program to program. Um, so I did mention um, the GovCMS program, um, the Single Digital Presence program. We're also involved in the New South Wales 1CX or Customer Service program, um, also wa.gov.au. So a, a real value that Salsa can add is, is, is sharing approaches and, and facilitating knowledge share um, between these programs. So that's what we really like to do. Um, more consolidated. So we spoke about the GovCMS um, program. Um, we spoke about the single digital presence program. So in GovCMS, there's um, over 300 sites um, that, that have been consolidated on that platform for over 100 um, agencies. And in terms of Victoria's single digital presence, um, we're really consolidating the user experience across uh, Victorian agency sites. So, you know, getting involved in that and driving that is really what Salsa is um, trying to do. What I wanted to do is really make this real, um, show some manifestations of these things. So just, just to highlight a couple of um, or three uh, key projects. Um, Geoscience um, Australia is, is the first one I wanted to highlight, the first project there, um, and the Digital Earth Australia website. 
Uh, Stuart Rollins from Salsa uh, provided a, a, a great presentation earlier in the day and had a lot of detail around the architecture and the, and the why of that project. But just to mention um, a few things about the project, uh, it's a decoupled um, architecture. Um, it employs static web technology. Um, it's built on the GovCMS uh, PaaS platform and, and there's many other things to that project that make it a sort of a next generation um, platform and approach and, and Stu's um, presentation's got a lot of details there. Uh, ultimately, the purpose statement of the, of, of the site, um, making it easier for scientists, academia, industry and citizens to discover Australian Earth data. So that again is about connection of, of citizen um, to content and, and, and data. So, you know, a great example. Uh, Health.vic is a, is a site we've very recently launched. Um, it was a site core um, migration to Drupal, um, to, to SDP in fact. And there was a very large um, amount of content that be, needed to be migrated. Um, so given that we, we used our open source um, content migration framework Merlin. Um, we'll speak a little bit about Merlin in the in the product slide next. Um, we use Merlin on, on health.vic, but we've used it for sort of 30, 40 other projects. And in terms of automation and validation of content migration, um, you know, it was really great, great thing to use. Uh, I mentioned the site launched um, it just weeks ago, uh, so that was great. And I think it's significant in this project to mention um, Salsa uh, and the project made you know, quite significant contributions back to the single digital single digital present platform. So artifacts built out of that project were, were contributed back um, to, to SDP. So we do that, we like to do that for all projects. In particular, this project contributed quite a number of um, artifacts back to SDP. Uh, eSafety is another one to mention. Um, this is a pretty, this is a nice site we had to build. Um, unique to this site, or, or a, a good part about this site was the, um, needing to support like multiple personas, um, parents, kids, educators, there was a number of personas that had to be considered, considered in the design, considered in the information architecture, the way the uh, site was architected. So that was a, a great project and, and a good thing to sort of come make come alive. And again, around that sort of engagement with citizen and, and providing a safer and more positive experience for, for citizens online. So what I wanted to do here was um, present a little bit about you know recent projects and what we've done in the past. Um, next slide speaks about you know some things that are that are in our future and some exciting uh, things to talk about. So I'll hand over to Akil and Danielle for these. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for that kind of uh, roundup of what Salsa does and where we are now. So looking a little bit into the future, we're trying to make it a simpler future. We're trying to connect. We're trying to um, produce or at least put together some products and systems and processes in place to make things better for both the um, government and the users of Drupal. And so some of those, we have two particular products we're gonna cover just right now. And one of them is Merlin, the other one's Civic Theme. I'll just cover Merlin right now. So uh, we're looking at kind of products that'll kind of work in concert um, with together to help with migration specifically and onboarding onto um, Drupal and making it less code-based. So Merle in particular, we found that the problem space was that in the context of government, many government agencies are trying to significantly consolidate the amount of systems they have, content um, and other web presences, especially when they have 15 different websites or only need four or five. Um, they're, they're now working towards consolidating these. There's plenty of um, uh, current examples, such as moving on to Drupal 9, for instance, and end of life has kind of forced a lot of this uh, shift to um, consolidating these platforms that they have online. And at the same time, they're also doing their own uplift of designs um, and upgrades through this. So, so Merlin, Merlin Core is basically a content migration tool that lowers the barrier to industry-wide um, for site migrations from any source of CMS to a target CMS. In this case, uh, mostly we're using it for Drupal. Um, the content migrations then become repeatable, they're predictable, and then largely automated, which then reduces the um, the errors and makes it easier to actually do it in progress and sync the content as you go through the process of the project. This in turn reduces the risk of manual errors, creates a smoother, faster, and cheaper migration option. Now, Merlin works with the Drupal Migrate module. Merlin creates structured data ready for import and the migrate module then uses that to import the content into menus, taxonomies, and nodes into Drupal itself. Now with Merlin, we launched Merlin uh, about um, earlier this year, actually no, late last year, and we've been using it for 
um, almost a year now, and it's a fairly mature product. And as Paul mentioned, we've kind of tested it with about 35 Drupal uh, migrations since it was launched um, late last year. So that's um, that's Merlin there, and I'll uh, pass it on to Danielle to talk about Civic Theme. All right. Uh, thanks, Akil. <laughs> so uh, Civic Theme is uh, not something we've launched. It is in progress. Uh, but what it will be uh, is an open source design system uh, really geared towards federal government agencies as well as uh, organizations, at least for uh, the first part, um, because a lot of times, right, uh, those government agencies and, and organizations are responsible for uh, implementing and creating their digital experiences. Uh, but we also know for all of us that are part of digital agencies that instead of having to, you know, use different themes all the time and, you know, really having to repeat a lot of the same work, that it would be great for us to be able to adopt and adapt an already existing design system uh, for our clients and, of course, for any uh, internal projects that we have that might uh, need a design system. So, um, you know, it's not just about building a new product, of course. <laughs> we want to make sure that there are um, really important business reasons and, you know, that everyone's getting a lot of value out of it. And, you know, I touched on it a little bit, but really the, the core reasons why uh, we're doing this especially is that there is a lot of duplication of work around uh, theming and, and design and design systems and really just trying to eliminate that in general. Um, you know, of course, there are going to be customizations. Um, you know, every uh, agency and, and organization is different, but really just trying to make sure that we have a core group of, you know, components and um, themes and Oh, I'm sorry, components and templates um, in order to make sure that we are reducing that duplication. Um, in addition, you know, of course, we're always going to have to do user testing and accessibility testing. Um, you know, I'm very passionate about both of those myself. Um, it's just the fact of, you know, even if you do want to do user testing, you know, on the out of the box um, theme for your client, you know, hopefully it will reduce that cost a little bit because it's already coming out of the box. Same thing with accessibility testing. And so the hope is that um, you'll be able to reduce the time, uh, the project complexity, the risk, you know, of course, uh, total cost of ownership in general, um, if those are repeatable, um, and also just making sure that there is knowledge sharing. Um, so as I stated in terms of uh, this is upcoming, but uh, it will be user tested, it will be accessible, um, there will be the components and templates I talked about. Um, there will be a storybook and a storybook will be available um, for you to create per client. Um, it will align to uh, the former uh, Australian government digital design system. There will be sample content. Um, so right, there's there's a lot here uh, that we're looking to do and, and excited to engage with the community um, and just really want to make sure that uh, everybody's able to better engage with uh, their clients or, you know, agencies and government um, can engage uh, better with, um, you know, their customers uh, and just really make sure that we're taking the focus um, out of uh, solely more of design, um, but focusing on information and services um, and content and, and some of the other pieces of the project um, in general. So, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and, and just to reiterate some of what Danielle was saying. So, the Civic Theme is in the works right now, but it is we're aiming to launch this as an open source project in about January coming, uh, hoping for December, but again, with the Christmas break, it'll probably be January, it'll be an open source project for the community. So the intent will be at least to have them available for GovCMS to, to begin with, and then that'll become uh, available to be used as a theme with GovCMS kind of SAS at the very least and PaaS as well. So that's um, one of the motivations for getting it out. Okay, I'm going to just jump to the next slide. So we have any we have time for questions and discussion now just covering a quick look at the q a here we've got Feel free to ask questions either in discussion or the live Q and A. And there's a question coming through. 
So do we have a link for Merlin civic theme? So Merlin, we can definitely provide you a link any second. I can actually provide you that. We have information about uh, Merlin right now. Civic theme, uh, there is uh, nothing published right now. We're working on it very furiously to get some information out and we're having some uh, web content actually uh, pages added very shortly. Uh, at the moment, it's kind of pre-release. So we're just finalizing the MVP build, and then we will be able to provide something on Civic Theme. If there, uh, we have got designs, we have got a roadmap, um, so we can make those available, uh, talking about what we're gonna work on, what we have achieved so far as well. Um, obviously in transparency for open community, we're trying to make everything available. So designs in Figma are available. You can take those designs as part of open source. You can work with those to kind of build out the first part of Civic Theme, at least the designs. We've already had some clients uh, work with those designs, which were then fed back into the core um, Civic Theme MVP build as well. So soon, so stay tuned for those, but we can. I will uh, quickly do that in a second. I'll provide some information about what we do have available for both of those. We have another question here. Paul, could Merlin assist with agencies bringing content into WAGov? Example, where there are more specific templates to move content to a generic page to an announcement or a specific page to a publication, etc. How do uploading files work? Um, so thanks for that question, R Robert. <laughs> um, uh, I, the answer to that is we, we probably have to see if and how it fits in. Um, Merlin um, usually is to do with uh, migration um, at the start of a project. However, ongoing migration is, is likely possible. I'll just probably have to get the likes of Stu and others that are the brainchild of this to um, to you know, provide their own um, opinion on that on that use case, but I definitely think it's worth considering and and a, and a valuable discussion because um, yeah, you and I have talked about you know that that challenge. Excellent. Another question from Carl: How has the Merlin? How has the Merlin's DX improved in the last in the past year? Don't want specifics, just generalizations. It was very involved when I was using it last. Uh, DX design experience. <laughs> so, so we are implementing um, the Merlin UI. It's a, another future thing to to, to think about. I, I believe that's probably what Carl's referring to in terms of yep. lowering the barrier to configure Merlin. Merlin used to be well. You have to configure a whole lot of techy yeah, sort of YAML, YAML files and the like. Um, that's being uplifted to, to to build a UI on top, which is a watch this space. So yeah, dev experience. Yes, uh, yeah, we're we're building a as I mentioned, building UI. So that should be much easier to actually manage the process. Um, there's another thing which we not going to mention right now, but that's on the works as well. And that will definitely kind of connect or join the dots once we launch that to help with the um, the migration process kind of from end to end. So that covers both um, Merlin and Civic Theme. So stay tuned for that one as well. Thanks, Carl. Uh, another one from, oh, that's a comment. Will there be a decoupled version of Civic Theme at some point? Decoupled Civic Theme. Um, I believe at the moment it is Drupal based and we are looking at, um, it's going to be uh, platform agnostic. So the aim will be that it can be used across different platforms, if that's what you're referring to, and therefore you can use a different front end and platform together. I hope that answers that. <laughs> okay. Don't know if there's that many more questions. We might wrap it up. Just checking the board, excellent. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I think we have a couple of interesting fun slides. <laughs> so, some of the uh, salsa team, this particular team prefer tacos, <laughs> and the rest of the team prefer burritos, as an FYI. <laughs> All righty, excellent. Thank you very much right. for your time. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much to Paul, Danielle, and Akil.
Um, it's always great hearing what the Salsa team has been up to. They've done some really good work over the few years. So, um, yeah, welcome. My name's Toby. I'm product lead here at Amazio. I'm based in Canberra. And I'm Sean, technical account manager uh, at Amazio, based in Wellington, New Zealand, and have just recovered from a power cut. So hopefully, that doesn't happen again. It's it's my turn this time, Sean. <laughs> I'm going I'm going at dark on you halfway through. Um. So yeah, we um we figured we'd take this opportunity. I think we nominally titled our session, um, "Know Your Enemy." Because one of the things that, that we think is really important um, in Drupal, in hosting, in in web, is being prepared for whatever's coming at you. But that preparation comes with an awful lot of knowledge. Um, so one of the things that Sean and the rest of the team of TAMS do is sort of keep a constant eye on sites, on what's happening to our sites, what's happening to other sites, what's happening around the world. And we thought we'd run you through some of our experiences in hosting large, high volume sites for multiple markets across the world. Um, we could do a super quick who is Amazy IO session, but looking down the list of attendees, I think there's probably pretty good knowledge. Um, we're a open source web ops hosting company. We have worked very closely with Salsa um, on a couple of the, the large Salsa projects here in Australia. Um, but we work with a number of customers across the world um, hosting out of, I think we've got 30, um, something like 30 clusters under management now um, across the world, pharmaceuticals, um, finance, media, government. And um, we have some pretty good experience at, at a number of these, um, in a number of these scenarios. So I figured we'd just run through some of the things that we've seen, some of the things that we work with, and some of the, the, the tools and some of the um, uh, knowledge that we can try and impart on people and show why knowing your enemy is as important as protecting against enemies you don't know. Yeah. And um, there's a few things that we can show off during this. Um, like, just disclaimer, this is all like going to be winged. And I also have a five-year-old in the background. So like, it's got about to get messy. <laughs> um, so I'll just share uh, the right screen. And hopefully you can put Toby and I on the left in the, hey, oh, not yet. Can you put the share screen in the middle? No. <laughs> no one. There we go. Okay. Apologies cool, cool. to Iona for that. <laughs> yeah, let's bring it on you. <laughs> so I'm hoping this is even remotely legible. I'll just try to zoom in a little bit. Um, so the first thing that we do at Amazio is we run literally every single domain that we possibly can through um, our CDN, which is Fastly. And the very first thing that that does is protects us against um, all the boring attacks. So um, by boring, I mean like level three and level four. These are like ICMP floods, UDP fl floods and stuff like that, which is it's just nice not having to worry about all that stuff. Um, and what you're looking at here is um, a, a live view on who's actually uh, visiting the the caching score site <laughs> globally so um yeah that's a that's pretty neat um the next thing is um it's all well and good to kind of see like traffic as it kind of comes in but it's really nice to introspect that and uh work out you know whether that traffic is desirable uh, because ultimately you don't want to send it at your origin if you don't need to because you know that's just a win for everybody um so what we do do is uh log every uh request that hits fastly into uh, a log file that goes into s3 and Elasticsearch, um and it's all logged in a friendly uh, json so you can do things like jq analysis if you just want to get something quick and dirty like how many requests were from this ip address during these day periods 
Um, or if you want something more detailed, you might switch over to Elasticsearch to, um, you know, do trends or visualizations or stuff like that. So, um, but I mean, like to do this is all kind of reactive. And so some of the cool stuff that we've been um, playing with recently has been on the more proactive side of things. And um, one of our larger customers that just has a, a single site with us um, in a single cluster um, is a smart sheet. So, and what we've done recently with them is they wanted to, like, they had a, a lot of attacks hitting them, like typically bot related. They had a lot of bots filling in their forms or yeah, enumerating pagination. Like if, if you've ever seen someone get to page 1036, you know, they've clearly not done that legitimately. No human being um, has the power to, <laughs> to do that. Um, so yeah, for them, they needed something a little bit more proactive than, you know, plain whack-a-mole with the, um, the traffic there. So a new technology we have the ability to do, and I'll see if I can make it bigger, um, is we can deploy something called signal sciences. And, and how we deploy it's quite unique as well. So it's deployed on the ingress on the Kubernetes cluster. So anything that hits origin, irrespective of the domain name, the host header, whether they even have a host header, um, will flow through signal sciences. And SIGSI is, I will abbreviate them too, because it's incredibly hard to say, um, is kind of that more proactive layer where it's analyzing the traffic, not just for your site, but globally. So one of its uh, neat features is it has something called a SIGSI IP. So if IP addresses have been known to do really dumb stuff um, across the network of SIGSI, then they'll get flagged and other sites will benefit from that, so like, a, like a network effect. So in, in, in this case, 103,000 requests were instantly just uh, black hole because they were silly buggers somewhere else globally and we didn't have to like manually tag them or you know do anything to um, uh, to do that really um, on top of that there's the standard you know OWASPy you know are they doing SQL injection you know God bless them um, cross-site scripting command execution all that kind of stuff and then if you do see someone doing something silly, you can find out what they've been doing. So this is an IP address from the country of Germany. And um, you can see that they're, yeah, they're just doing stuff that people just do on the internet. So they're requesting index.php, but with a query parameter and, uh, and null bytes and a whole bunch of other things. But the cool thing is that you see that um, SIGSI is returning uh, 406, which basically means don't do that. Um, I don't want it. <laughs> and it does this decision uh, most of the time less than one millisecond. So it's extremely quick. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, it's, it's, that one took three. That one took three. So, yeah, that one's two. So it's extremely quick. It doesn't rely on a third party to make that decision. It just every now and then just checks in with the SIG sign network to update its rule sets and, and you know, make sure it's running, running the latest um sort of blocking behavior um and what's really cool is we can take these oh we're seeing like a bunch of like dot dot slash dot dot slash sort of path traversal things and we're like oh what about the customers who don't have signal sciences you know because it's not free um what do they do and how do they benefit from this and that's where and this is going to get extremely techy very quickly. So ignore the screen if you don't want to read code. Um, but we can translate this into rules that effectively run at our edge layer inside Fastly. So without, I don't want to explain that, Bridget, because I don't truly understand it. It took a little while to get right. But <laughs> yeah. And um, Basically, what this means is it's going to look for dot dot slash in the URL or the query string. Um, and if it finds it, it's going to 
uh, block it effectively. So this way, other customers of Amazio will get the benefits of these rules um, without having to have the kind of more proactive kind of blocking. Um, and there's even a dedicated one for what we just saw, which is if you have Etsy password in a URL, just go away. <laughs> I don't want to see you. And uh, yeah, and you could actually see that um i just type in uh, etsy password which i haven't done and hopefully this works um there you go that's what um that's what the WAF looks like <laughs> <laughs> that's the band hammer um so yeah i think that's um i guess what i spend a bit of my time doing and i'm sorry i've just stopped screen sharing can you uh, <laughs> keeping your day interesting um so that's why i spend a lot of my kind of day doing just looking after um the emerging threats that we're seeing and uh, often it's for technologies that you won't be running like there's some firewall that's just had a cve announced with throat remote code execution and someone's just wrote some crawler to scan every ip address that they can find and you know it's often you know, there'll be like JSP or ASPX or a whole bunch of other things that you don't really see in Drupal land, but they'll still hit your Drupal site with it. This is, I mean, this is one of the things that came up in the, the session this morning. Someone asked the question, why, why do you need a CDN? And a CDN does some of this work for you. It relieves some of the pressure. It takes some of the load. Good CDNs may have some um, capabilities. But there's so many levels and so many layers that these malicious actors or <laughs> inadvertently malicious actors, because we all we've all seen um, spiders that get stuck in infinite loops in search pages and stuff like that, that can wreak havoc with a site. So having the WAF capabilities, having those sort of bot detection capabilities is is really important for us as the first line of defense. But as part of an organization that learns, being able to see what's happening in one place and utilize that information in more places is, is absolutely critical. And it's not just at the Fastly or the Signal Sciences layer because of the way that containerized hosting works. We've got Nginx configuration per site. So we've got a standard Nginx configuration for Drupal. As we learn things from the edge, we can pass that all the way back down to the individual Drupal containers so that sites who elect to host their sites or organizations that elect to host their sites without CDNs and without WAFs get some of that knowledge too. So really make sure it passes all the way through the organization. I mean, that's right. And like, that's where a lot of the, all the goodies in nginx.conf um everything that's in there is in there for a reason um you know one of the, the kind of the, the best goodies in there is it blocks anything from executing unless it's index.php um which if you run a drupal site is really cool um it also blocks this the, the, the statistics module which i also think is quite cool because <laughs> that module is also terrible um and yeah i, I that's that trickle down kind of effect that you know you can sort of block it at the layer that makes the most sense and um yeah having it um pushing it towards the edge does mean it just happens a bit faster and you can survive a bit more of a volumetric attack but say you go off and use your own cdn then um, you're going to need to push it down the layer if you can't push it up another thing we do is a, is a lot of sort of traffic scale and shape monitoring so um for the larger customers for the larger sites we have a fairly intimate knowledge of, of what their traffic patterns look like. So we could tell what is a good day, what is a bad day. And um, we collect a lot of this stuff. We run like vast amounts of Elasticsearch logging. We do an awful lot of Prometheus and Grafana monitoring of sort of scale up events and being able to quickly and easily identify outliers there is something that um, the team is is really keen on because we might not see it come through ordinary channels but trying to work out why a site suddenly goes up to 12 
pods or why something's slow to scale up or why um what are the knock-on effects we may see the leading edge of it before we actually see a site outage before we actually see database um issues so it's really there's an awful lot of monitoring that goes into seeing what a site is how it lives and breathes what normal looks like yep as this frantically seeing if i can bring up a grafana dashboard <laughs> let's show something useful <laughs> it, it, you can tell sean i did a lot of preparation for this we, we were going to but his power was out so oh yeah it just ruined everything <laughs> um has anybody got any questions that they desperately want to find out from us um or contributions comments etc more than happy to take those um for those that weren't in the talk this morning sean did a talk about caching gamification um and launched his new uh caching score.com site to the world where you can find out how good or bad your site is um and this comes back to the optimizing performance really pushing for reliability um all of these things count it's it's not just making a site and putting it on the internet and letting the world consume it it's making a site putting it on the internet making sure it's as good as it could be, making sure it's as responsive, making sure it's stable, making sure that it's adequately protected. They're all part of that wraparound service. It doesn't finish on go live day. Yeah, and actually it's not really kind of talked about too much, but like having a super high cash hit rate is the best form of defense you can possibly have. Um, I once worked on a site um, that was, um, the, I think the Commonwealth Games 2018 uh, Gold Coast site. Um, I don't think it's around anymore, but um, for that, we, we had a, a seating in place there. And I think we got the cash hit rate up to 99.925. Um, so like that means like 75 out of every 100,000 requests were able to trickle through. Um, and I think we went a little bit overboard on that because we did everything we possibly could to prevent uh, having a miss but you know there's nothing stopping any other equally as busy site having something which is also as impressive um, it just may mean that you might need to get a bit tricky um, by putting through like allow lists for query string parameters stuff like that becomes more useful um, to get that last few little bits of uh, hit rate but i mean as a result like i mean how can you attack a site that's perfectly cacheable like because you can just turn your origin off and the site still can still functions. <laughs> so, yeah. I, uh, I worked on a project and I just frantically checked the uh, attendees list to see if I'm embarrassing anybody here um, that uh, was had a really high cache offload. Um, and the request from the business area was to test it until it breaks. And I pointed out that there's much greater resources than me at play here in testing one of these large global CDN providers until it breaks would be a very expensive, very expensive errand. You'd have to spin up an awful lot of um, floods to be able to take one of them down. So yeah, we're good at some massive aspects of the business, but these CDNs, uh, they're incredible at handling immense volumes of traffic. That's that's their day job. So let's make them do the work and not our creaky old database servers and backend PHP. Okay. Okay. Yep, sorry, just juggling kids. Um... <laughs> The, the third aspect is that the kind of work we do with agencies on sort of optimizing their sites behind the scenes like sean in his years has seen an awful lot of things and some of the clients we work most closely with will sort of help try and guide them down the the path most traveled because anytime you go out on your own if, if you're searching in stack overflow and um no one's <laughs> seem to have had your problem before it means one of two things you're either a genius or an idiot um I, I like to think that i'm a genius when i find no answers but it also likely means that you're the first person to have thought about doing this and that's never a great place to be so a lot of the experience comes with helping steer people towards solutions that do drive high capability they drive um stability and they drive scalability that's really important 
that sites are looking at this and just because a solution works, it doesn't mean it's the best solution for you. Yeah, I'm the biggest proponent of like, just sometimes the best answer isn't like the, the shiniest um, answer. Um, if you pick on JS frameworks, then there's always going to be a new JavaScript framework of choice, but um, yeah, something about Drupal is it has like cache tags kind of built in. If you want to do something with JavaScript, now you've got to, um, yeah, uh, somehow come up with a, a similar way to uh, execute the same built-in kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I'd be interested to see what those other talks are today around decoupling and how they deal with um, uh, cache sniping, um, so to speak, rather than doing full cache purges. Um, because ideally you do exactly what the cache tags are doing, which is just getting rid of the smallest amount possible from cache. Um, I'm more than happy to wrap up now, unless anyone else has got questions or comments or anything they want us to handle. I do have to run off and retrieve my children from their educational establishment. we got nothing to cover then thank you so much um for, for listening to us um check us out maisy.io or google for us we're pretty much everywhere these days um but more than happy yeah. to take any of these kind of questions um you'll find us sean and i both around the drupal slack regularly um ask us questions seek our advice sometimes we're kind and generous with it other times we're Time um, poor. <laughs> time poor is a good answer, yes. <laughs> but yeah, also, um, if you want to know more about um, the advanced uh, WAF capabilities, then yeah, always up for a, a private demo if you want to, you know, do something a bit more, um, yeah, exact to the, your customer's requirements or your own requirements. Yeah, happy to go through that on a more of a one on one basis as well, if that makes more sense for you. Perfect. Well, we'll let you get on with your day. You've got two minutes back that you didn't have before. So go make it. You probably can't make a cup of tea in two hours, two minutes. But um, thank you so much. Have a good rest of the session. See ya. See ya.